Kia ora koutou. Um, well, thanks very much, Karen. Um, so I apologise, I, I thought we were finishing at three, so we've had a bit of a miss problem over that, but we'll be all right. The only challenge is that immunisations used to be really simple, and as the years go by, it's got more and more complex. So <laughs> it seems to be every time I teach immunisation, we used to manage it in 20 minutes, and now it seems to take way, way longer. So I'm a local GP. I run the Immunisation Advisory Centre, and I also, as Karen said, I do work internationally for the WHO. There's this committee called SAGE, the Strategic Advisory Group of Experts, which sets the immunisation advice around vaccines and immunisation programmes for the world and I'm currently chairing the measles rubella eradication committee as you know that's a bit politically hot at the moment and not doing very well so that's a different topic but very happy to talk about why we haven't eradicated polio and why it's going to be very hard to eradicate measles none of which has anything to do with science so today we're going to try and talk more about the science than the politics around vaccines. So I always have to start from this point. I'm, I'm talking to colleagues and the converted, but I have to say, if you ever thought of going into neurosurgery, you were way better off in general practice. <laughs> you know, what we do is so strongly evidence-based that one thing we forget day in, day out is the power and the strength of the evidence base behind vaccines. And when you're fed up with your job and you just want to go home and throw it all in, I just remember this, folks, because, you know, it's so easy to forget day in, day out out when it's bloody grinding but this is making a huge difference yeah and the other thing I wanted to show this is just out of interest my husband is a very nervous flyer so as the world feels like it's going to hell in a handcart well there's some good news and some of these are really sweet if you look at this one <laughs> you are much less likely to die in a plane crash now <laughs> the other thing I really like is you're not going to die in battle. Isn't that cool? So I really like some of these things. <laughs> it makes me feel a bit better about the world instead of about talking about Trump or Brexit. Yeah. Um, the, the slightly sad bit is that we have done incredibly well internationally on immunisation programmes, but over the last few years it's levelled off for a whole lot of complex reasons. And when we talk about measles, you know, you'll see all the complex international reasons why we're running into trouble. So that's a bit sad because we had done fantastically well in the world. These are the general areas that come up all the time. So we'll talk about the scheduled changes, a couple of major diseases, the huge challenges with private market vaccines and the equity issues for us as frontline providers. High risk groups and how on earth we identify high risk groups. And then there's just a few other bits and pieces. And when I get down to current challenges, I'll talk about vaccine hesitancy. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so firstly the schedule changes. What's going to change next year is actually not huge. And the only major change next year, there's two of them. One is that the pneumococcal primary course, which has traditionally been six weeks, three months and five months, is just going to be six weeks and five months. So we're dropping one primary course dose because there's good evidence of the effectiveness of a primary course of two. So it's just dropping the synflurix at three months. Now, if you have very high risk infants, as we know now, they will continue to have Prevnar 13 rather than Synflurex. Now, you know, Synflurex has got 10 serotypes in it. Prevnar 13's got 13. The difference between the two vaccines is probably minimal, but New Zealand's being ultra cautious by continuing to use Prevnar 13 for high risk kids. Okay? So that's why there's still this confusion with the little kids. If you have a little kid with really high risk of pneumococcal, they should be having Prevnar 13. Yes. You've put a booster at 12 months, so is that another visit? Oh, my apologies, that was a slip up. It will still be at 15 months, but we are expecting eventually to move to two doses. But well spotted, could you just change that to 15 months? It will be 15 months next year. Um, the intention in the long term, but not next year, is to move to two visits in the second year of life, but that won't happen next year. Now the other big difference, and this is quite funny, is that ADT for adult boosting is going to go to Tdap. Now the reason for this, my understanding, is that the Tdap came in cheaper than the ADT. <laughs> I love this reasoning. I mean, it's very cool that we've got pertussis within the ADT, but in terms of population protection, it probably makes very little difference because pertussis, you don't get longevity of immunity. You know, your immunity wanes within about four to six years. In fact, you still carry probably within a few months of being vaccinated. So we're not going to offer extra population protection. So let's not overpromise. But for any individual, hey, it's nice to get a bit of pertussis boosting as well. Now, the 45-year-old traditionally was a booster. 
Um, I have to admit, I was one of those GPs, and still am, that completely don't get around to boosting at 45. I'm sure there's some really committed GPs in this room, but I'm not. And I wasn't boosting regularly and effectively at 45, because the evidence is really very slim. So now the 45 is really just for a catch-up if you haven't had a full primary course and a booster. So if you had your primary course and you had your booster at 11, do not worry about the 45-year-old, all right? It just, look, we weren't doing it systematically anyway. So, you know, we're gonna focus on systematically doing the 65 with, sorry, I asked this question before, 65 with flu and Zostavax, yeah, okay? So, you know, we've got 65 embedded as an age where we should be vaccinating. So that's the schedule change. now. There's a few brand changes, just so people know. Those are brand changes, not schedule changes. This is just Pharmac getting the best price. These vaccines are equivalent, all right? There's some concern that the vaccine for hepatitis B we're moving to is too big a dose for neonates, and we're still trying to sort that out. But that won't apply much in primary care. Now, what else could change, and we're going to see changing in the future, is eventually, but not next year, we will probably move to two visits in the second year of life. Now, for those of you who are vaccinated and giving four injections to toddlers, bloody amazing, nice to move away from. <laughs> Go New Zealand practice nurses, we are stunning. But it's hard work, yeah, it really is. And we've done well, but there's a whole lot of reasons why we probably need an extra visit in the second year of life. So why do you think we might eventually want an extra visit in the second year of life? What else would we like to add in? Yeah, meningococcal vaccines. So we need a space for meningococcal vaccines. We'd also like to bring down MMR2 from four to the second year of life. So for epidemic control now, we can give MMR at 12 months and MMR2 any time after a month after that. So we are suggesting for epidemic control, MMR1 at 12 months, MMR2 at 15 months with your schedule vaccines, okay? And Auckland's got officially has lowered its MMR. Is anyone's from Auckland here? It's officially lowered the MMR1 age. That's for epidemic control. I think we'd like to eventually get that embedded in the schedule. Meningococcal vaccines. And the other, eventually, we'll probably have a second varicella dose, um, which you can combine with MMR. Okay, and we would quite like to put an extra pertussis in the second year of life to get better pertussis protection. So that's the way the schedule's moving, okay? Just a, a few shifting around here and there. One other longer term possibility is the possibility of shifting from a primary course of two from three, but that's still being discussed because that would mean you'd be important that everybody had their pregnancy pertussis to protect the younger infants. Because if you move to a primary course of two and you haven't got pregnancy pertussis protection on board, pertussis is your problem. So those are the ways we're thinking. Now, before I get to pertussis, which I think is our biggest issue, measles. Okay, oh, anything else about schedule change, guys? We're all happy with the schedule change, so it's reasonably straightforward next year. Um, right, so measles. Measles, of course, is the challenge at the moment. So I've got a few questions for you guys. So my first question is, my infant's eight months old and we're travelling to Auckland. I'm worried about him being exposed to measles. What can I do? So the current recommendation for infants under 12 months is you can give an extra MMR vaccine to infants aged six to 12 months. You don't give it regularly. Auckland's a bloody big city. Yes, there are a lot of outbreak cases there, but you're still extremely unlikely to get it just going somewhere in Auckland. There is quite a big outbreak, particularly centred in counties at the moment. But so in general, I'd want to know what that infant's risk was, not just they're going to Auckland nebulously. Um, so most infants travelling to Auckland right now would not need an extra MMR. Remembering that if they were in contact with measles, you can give immunoglobulin. Okay, so you've got that backup plan as well. Um, if they're going to a high-risk country, um, then absolutely think of giving infants an, an extra dose of MMR. So anyone who's travelling to Venezuela or Ukraine or somewhere where the Madagascar, if you want to go and see monkeys, there's really high risk of measles. So look up the traveller advice, mm. okay? Um, I think I was vaccinated as a child. I'm now 27 year old. Am I at risk? Should I have an MMR? Now the question is, I think, if you've got two documented doses, sweet. If they go, I think, don't believe them. Just vaccinate. Mm. 
And not, not that I don't trust my fellow humanity, but also if people say I had measles when I was young. I'm also really suspicious. I had this woman who told me her, she'd had measles three times, so she didn't need the vaccine. It's like, so, you know, we're not good necessarily at diagnosing measles. Mm. So unless we're really clear about our documentation, just vaccinate, okay? Um, my father was born in Syria. He's now 58. Do you think he's at risk of measles? No. No. Now, we are seeing some measles in the people over 50, just not a lot. So the general rule of thumb is anybody born before the moon landing in New Zealand, um, you were likely to have been exposed to wild measles. So you're unlikely to get measles. Now, it's not a guarantee. You're unlikely. Now, so what's the situation for a Syrian or somebody born somewhere else? Measles vaccine was introduced around the world from the early mid-60s. So anybody who was born anywhere before the early or mid-60s, you would assume, unless they were born under a rock and didn't move, were likely to have been exposed to measles, okay? So that guy's highly likely in Syria to have been exposed to measles. I think the earliest program was the Americans in about the mid-60s, okay? So on the whole, older people are safe. Can't guarantee it. No guarantee, we're still seeing some measles in older people. So I do say, if somebody's really anxious, there is no harm in over-vaccinating. Right, so measles outbreaks at the moment. This is what it's like looking like at the moment. Now, if you look in the social media, you know, everybody thinks that there's masses of measles in the States. But as usual with the world, it's not really, there's not that much in the States. We've got massive measles in some of these countries. You know, DR Congo, you know, where you've got um, Ebola at the moment. There's loads of measles. Madagascar's got a huge measles outbreak, Ukraine. And in our part of the world, Philippines is the biggest problem. Yeah, so these are where you're seeing. In fact, out of the three major strains that have arrived in New Zealand, I think two of them have come from the Philippines. And I think one might have come from Thailand or Myanmar. So that's where we've got outbreaks at the moment, which is really disheartening. And this is what it's look, looking like here. And Christchurch is on top of theirs. The case numbers are still going up in South Auckland. And we all know the reasons. We know that um, people have missed out on vaccination. Now, most of that is not anti-vaccination most of that was 20 years ago we were just lousy at delivering vaccines our systems weren't great we didn't even recall you know hairdressers were way ahead of us <laughs> do you remember my hairdresser has so on top of it you know mm. i do exactly everything my hairdresser says <laughs> whereas it took us ages to figure out proper effective systematic approach to offering vaccines so loads and loads of people just didn't get vaccines and then on top of that you had the vaccine hesitancy from the wakefield concerns about mmr and autism which have added to people's fears. So we've got a huge amount of midlife New Zealand population who miss out, okay? You can see there's still a few cases over 50, but the numbers are just small. And the other thing is if a vaccinated person does get measles, it can happen, and it tends to be quite mild. So, you know, you can get breakthrough measles too. So, of course, the answer for this is um, there's a higher risk of imports now. So there's a higher risk of measles coming in. We've got immunity gaps in our population. MMR1 is the most vital. So if you're feeling worn out and knackered and you're going to systematically go through your population base, at least get MMR1 into everybody. And then MMR2 as you can. But numerically, MMR1 makes the difference. So vaccinate everybody that breathes or moves under 50, you know, that's enthusiastic and loves the idea of needles. There's no concern with over-vaccinating. We're talking about a live attenuated virus that you give to a body. If you've already got an antibody response, it will immediately deactivate the virus. So a person who's already got immunity will have very little side effect to an MMR, except a slightly sore arm. Okay, so there's no concerns about over-vaccinating. That's my measles, I think. That was it for measles, yeah. So any concerns, any questions about measles? We are at high risk of losing our elimination status because of the outbreak going on in counties at the moment. We absolutely have to get on top of it. I think nationally it's pathetic that we haven't put more effort into it and at the DHB level. And what it takes is going through our records, GP records, just going through them. And anybody without clear records, don't go hunting, just offer them vaccination. I wish to delay the start of the vaccination program until my infant's immune system is a little more mature. Why should you not delay it? What's the one compelling reason you shouldn't delay the six week in pertussis? Babies get sicker from pertussis, okay? Good old Cameron Grant data, you're two to four times more likely to end up in hospital in New Zealand if you delay the start of your vaccination program. So I talk disease, you know, and then you can go and say, 
the infant immune system is a wonderful thing. The moment it's born, it's flooded with thousands of antigens, you know. You can add all of that in, but I talk initially disease. Your child is at risk of pertussis. If you do not want to start vaccination, do not take your child outside the house. Don't go through shopping centres. Don't mix with other people. Stay at home. You know, and follow that argument through. And if they want to do all that and move to a desert island, then you can delay it, you know, including the parent, because the parent can bring it home, OK? And often a lot of these people, unfortunately, the mum hasn't had pregnancy vaccination either. So that one... Really push. Now, it looks like we are beginning to wane on this current epidemic, but also those chronic coughs we're seeing out there, a lot of them are pertussis. So our Australian colleagues do point of care testing for PCR, and, and particularly in the elderly, they are picking up truckloads of pertussis. So even our data that we did a study in an inter-epidemic period, chronic coughs over two weeks, 20% were pertussis and higher in kids. So a lot of the chronic coughs we're seeing will be pertussis. Too late to diagnose, too late to treat. But there's masses of pertussis around. The more you look, the more you find. So Australia has way higher rates of community pertussis because they're looking for it. All right, They have similar to us in hospital pertussis. So pertussis is everywhere. You get it recurrently. Our vaccination program cannot eradicate pertussis. It's not like measles. So the focus of our program is to protect young infants. All right, the whole focus. So the issues, little kids, it's throughout the whole community. And if you look at the hospitalization rates, just to ver verify the fact that it's little kids we're worried about. Um, so this is my little summary slide. It's most severest in the youngest. So the key message timeliness of delivery okay but the second key message is vaccinate pregnant women is if you vaccinate in pregnancy the English data is showing that the newborn infants for the first couple of months of their life have more than 90% protection it's really really effective so you know your little soundbite for parents is in the previous epidemic we had four infants who died who were too young to have started their immunisation program. If we'd been given pregnancy pertussis, then those infants would not have died. So that's my soundbite to the parents, is we can stop infants dying. We can stop them ending up in intensive care. I mean, you can still get pertussis, but it was much likely to be mild, OK? So um, we talked about pregnancy vaccination. Now, originally, the early data, we, we recommend vaccinating from 28 weeks. Now, what we do know now with the data is immunogenicity data, particularly from 16 weeks, is very good, 16 to 28 weeks, OK? The immunogenicity data in the second trimester is good. There's very limited data from 13 to 16 weeks. So I think the Swiss are the only country in the world that recommends from 13 weeks. New Zealand has recently come out and said you can vaccinate from 13 weeks. Based on the British data and the international data of immunogenicity, I'd say from 16 weeks. Um, I prefer the second trimester. You get higher um, immunogenicity results in the second trimester versus the third. Now having said that, so yeah, you get better effective in the second trimester and if you're going to have a preterm baby, you're going to miss out. So there's sort of two compelling reasons. So we, IMAC, are recommending start from 16 weeks. So the moment somebody pees on a stick and they've got two lines, get it in our recall because we'll never see them again, you know, and they vanish. And your point about the fact that the LMCs are moving but not yet, a lot of them still don't mention it. I have to say obstetricians don't mention it either. I've got obstetricians in my line of fire, you know, so it's not just LMCs. They haven't got their heads around it. So we need a social shift on this one. We're moving slowly. I have to say, LMCs a few years back were totally anti-vaccination, so we're beginning to see a shift. I don't think aggressively putting them in a quarter and shooting them is an effective strategy, and I think we're slowly, even though you feel like it sometimes, <laughs> slowly, gently, well, not even gently, gently, we're putting a lot of different strategy in to, to getting the data out there, and so I'm talking up baby disease. So mums won't do it for themselves, but if you say to the mum, you will protect your baby much less likely to die of whooping cough, much less likely to die or end up in hospital of flu. Infants under six months have really high rates of flu. So, you know, get vaccinated to protect your baby. The mothers buy that, you know, whereas if we talk to them about protecting themselves, they're a bit, nah, maybe not, you know. So the baby stuff, I think, is a really compelling argument. Any angles we can, guys, to move this along so it becomes socially normalised is the way we have to go. Coverage rates are still only 30 40%. They're terrible, you know. 
Really depressing. Mm -hmm. Does cocoon vaccinating work? So the next question people come along and say, I want the grandparents to be vaccinated. In fact, it was really funny. I just had a grandchild recently and I was ordered to get a vaccination. (laughs) Now, to be honest, the evidence for cocoon vaccine is actually very weak. (laughs) I did what I was told. But the evidence for cocoon vaccination is very weak. And the main reason is because you probably still can carry it in the nasopharynx even though you're vaccinated. Having said that, if a family wants it and sees it as a good idea, go for it. From an individual protection point of view, it's a really good idea, particularly if the mother wasn't vaccinated. Okay, So if the mother missed out on vaccine, then definitely cocoon vaccinating the grandparents, those in close contact is worth doing. All right, So I'm not again cocoon vaccinating. I think it's worth doing, but that's from a population national program it won't go on a program because there's no population evidence it works does that make sense so good but not absolutely necessary i think oh and in terms of your point about pregnancy we do have up on our website now a video really aimed at trying to shift this this rhetoric we've also got a change in the people um in the college of midwives recently we've got some really top of the college of midwives some really pro-vaccination people so I hope we're going to see a change, guys. So we've got our video if you want to put it up in your waiting rooms, you know. Um, yeah, so anything else about pertussis? So we're all comfortable. Most of the schedule timing is focused around pertussis. So the other vaccines are just there for the ride. So when people say, can I delay it? Well, you could delay the hepatitis B, you know, if you weren't a carrier in the family. But it's we're in combination vaccines. And we are not going to start offering split vaccines because there is no scientific reason for offering split vaccines. So why would we do it? So New Zealand's going, no, nah, you can't have split vaccines. Sorry, guys. There was no science behind that. And we're going to stand by that because that also is pushing the pace. Because for a while, way back in the UK, they were trying to split yeah, the MMR. Right. That, and yeah. They were trying to ship single measles antigen yeah. from, you know, Ulaanbaatar or somewhere. It was like, <laughs> sorry, Ulaanbaatar, <laughs> probably from China. <laughs> so, OK, moving on. That was the easy stuff. But no one informed me there are good vaccines that aren't on the national schedule that can be used to protect my children. So you useless GPs out there are not telling me what's available. You useless practice nurses. I went to my practice. They didn't tell me I could have protected my baby. Luckily, New Zealand doesn't have litigation insurance. This is a huge ethical dilemma. It's really huge. There are vaccines on the private market that are of benefit. They haven't yet been assessed by Pharmac as having enough population protection to make it cost-benefit worthwhile against all the drugs we're lined up against now. Okay? So, what's on your list that you think we should be offering people? Meningococcal vaccines we'll talk about. What else? Flu vaccine for children. Flu vaccine for children and for, uh, and for ring vaccination of high risk. Yeah, what else? There's another big area that really hurts my head. Pneumococcal vaccines for adults. Okay, so these are big areas. So here's my little list. Okay, so firstly, the problem is the cost is really high. Consumers want to be given the choice, even people that... I'm gatekeeping, assuming my patients can't afford it. And, you know, that's probably wrong of me, you know, to gatekeep and assume just because I've got a patient on a benefit that they're not going to have a vaccine for their kid. I'm making wrong assumptions here, you know. So, And I'm not systematically offering them to my... Now, we had an old poster from a Mac, and I think we need to update it that many of you might have had on your walls, just so that at least in the waiting room there's a poster saying these vaccines are available. I will try and get that updated, because at least if we had a poster or something, then at least people know that this is what's available. Uh, Separately, of course, from the travel vaccines, because the moment people travel, they all want vaccines. So whoever made the point, flu vaccination for kids, but particularly flu vaccine with all you young, healthy, vibrant people in this room is pretty effective. So for, you know, healthy adults and older children, 60, maybe even 70 percent effective sometimes, depending on the match. But for anyone with chronic comorbidities, the elderly, your immune system goes down the tubes and the vaccine's not very effective. So probably for many of our very elderly, it's probably not working at all. So we're vaccinating on the basis that flu's a big disease, but we may not be helping that much. And really a better strategy would be population protection. That would be a better strategy. So we should be throwing (coughs) flu vaccine 
at people around them, which is why we should all be vaccinated. And I personally think it is inexcusable for a healthcare provider not to be vaccinated. How dare we see chronic people with high risk conditions and assume that we're not going to give them flu because we know there's a lot of asymptomatic transfer of flu. Okay, so it is ethically unacceptable for us. Right, so flu, pneumococcal I'm going to talk about more because it's really hard, and I'll talk about meningococcal, and I've mentioned pertussis ring protection. So that's my little list of what I think on the private market are the most useful at the moment, okay? And I'll talk about pneumo and meningia because I think they're the biggies. Okay, so firstly pneumo, this is really tricky, guys. The, the evidence base here is still evolving. So Mr Jones is 72, he's got severe COPD. Should I be offering him pneumococcal vaccine and which vaccine? 13 followed by 23. Where does he get his money from? Okay, so the problem about pneumococcal vaccines. Prevnar 13, bloody good vaccine, fantastic. Only 13 serotypes. It was designed for paediatric pneumococcal. In the paediatric population, your serotype distribution is narrower. In adults, your distribution of pneumococcal serotypes is way wider. 23, it's got 23 serotypes in it and it's better coverage but it's an old-fashioned vaccine. Its immune response is not quite so vigorous. Okay, so my, my bottom line summary is great vaccine, highly effective, but a narrow serotype, so it doesn't cover all the adult types. Better serotype distribution, uh, highly effective against IPD, but invasive pneumococcal disease in primary care is not such a problem to us. It's community-acquired pneumonia. 23 has some effect against community acquired pneumonia, not huge. So where does that leave us? Well, I think people with high risk of pneumococcal disease, there's definitely a gain for these vaccines. Where does the line lie between the cost and who's at high risk? So just to do my head in, those are the two vaccines, okay? The original PCV13 study suggested though it works well on the 13 serotypes. When you look at the impact overall for adults over 65, no significant effect against all-cause pneumonia. All right, but when they did reanalyze it, it suggested there was some difference. Now this is PPV23. The vaccine effectiveness against invasive pneumococcal disease is clear. Some countries use PPV23 in all over 65s. Reasonable, but invasive pneumococcal disease is rare. So, you know, this is a trade-off, you know. There's a lot of over 65s in the country. So, yep, it works against invasive pneumococcal disease. PCV13, when they reanalyzed the data, did suggest that it does have some rate reductions, okay, overall. It's not huge. So that's community-acquired pneumonia. It does have some effect against, which is the biggie, community-acquired pneumonia. So there is some gain. It's not vast, but there is some gain. Um, and the problem is who's at high risk? This is where it really, really does my head in, okay? The red ones, those are the ones that currently we're funded on the high risk program now. The ones in black are not funded. And if you go to Pharmac and say, I'd like to fund all our chronic heart diseases, they will fall off their chairs because the numbers are huge, mm -hmm. yeah? And it's interesting, I find, that chronic heart disease, your relative risk of pneumonia, pneumococcal, is actually higher than chronic lung disease. So mm. I, in my simplicity, have just been focusing on chronic lung disease. But there's some other biggies in there, liver and heart. I think most of us would recognise immunocompromising, but a lot of us are missing, focusing on lung but not the others. I think we're aware of neuromuscular, but think of chronic heart, think of chronic liver. It's a big group of people in our populations. Okay, And then... There's this thing called stacking. So if you had somebody who's Māori background, who's a smoker and has a bit of alcohol abuse, all of those stack upon each other. So we're being very simplistic, just going, I'm just going to seize out heart disease. If I took a bit of that and a bit of that and a bit of that, it all adds up. So there's a lot of people who are at actually really high risk of community-acquired pneumococcal pneumonia that we could be offering the vaccine to. And I don't have an answer for us on that one. Yeah, and the other problem about um, community-acquired pneumonia is the ethnic issue that's particularly high in Māori people. So once again, this is actually really tricky for us. So I haven't got solutions on this one, guys. So this is my current suggestion. PCV 13 followed by 23, and if you can't afford 13, which is really horribly expensive, at least go for 23. If you've given 23, you can't then give the 13 straight away. You have to wait a year. So it is a bit of a chicken and egg, but, you know, better than not. Okay, 
So we sussed on any other questions about pneumococcal? I actually think pneumococcal is probably the hardest area of all. This one's a little easier. <laughs> she says with a small chuckle. Yeah. So meningococcal disease. So my summary of meningococcal disease currently right now is it's very rare, but it's bloody terrifying and you don't want to miss it. So it's really hard for us. It's frontline. And of course, we all know difficult diagnosis. Use antibiotics early. Don't hesitate. OK, we all know that message. Now, at the moment, 50 percent of all meningococcal disease is B. OK, 50 percent is pretty well the other four types, A, C, Y, and W. There is one vaccine that covers B. There are other vaccines that cover A, C, W, and Y. So when somebody says, what vaccine should you use, you are equipoised. They are <laughs> both need to be used. I do not have an answer one over the other. All right? So if you can only afford one, go for the cheaper, because really one will stop 50%, one will stop 50%. The age group that gets um, meningococcal disease is infants and toddlers. They're the biggest age group by far. And then there's a second group, much lower numbers, but definitely second group in late teenagers. Okay, Higher risk, as we all know, is crowded conditions, smoking, poverty. So infants and toddlers in crowded conditions, smoking, poverty, which is why Northland has seen an outbreak. Okay, And then teenagers, particularly hostel living, stools, you know, correctional facilities. Teenagers do all sorts of interesting teenager things and share each other's mucus freely and happily. So, you know, we, we can't manage to stop teenagers sharing mucus freely and happily, so vaccination's a good strategy. Says me with teenagers, yeah. Um, now, so B is now 50%. The rest has traditionally been type C. But the big problem is type W is increasing in different parts of the world and New Zealand is seeing this particular increase as well and it's now approximately 25%. Now the problem with W is it's even more lethal than the other types. So it's a hypervirulent strain, case fatality rates bloody high and even worse it's atypical presentation. So my paediatric colleagues are telling me it's turning up with diarrhoea. So this is the age group okay so you can see the huge burden of disease is in the little kids and then there is some in um, and the, you know you do see the other problem with W is it goes across the age group just to make it even harder. Right so there's the two groups now C, type C alone, is still funded for high-risk kids under one. But essentially for us on the private market, you're not going to be using C anymore. You're going to be using a quadrivalent, okay? So the traditional polysaccharides we used to use for travel, they've gone, don't use polysaccharides anymore. Conjugates are the way to go. So you've got B, which is the new B vaccine. It's not a conjugate. It's a protein-based vaccine, and it's pretty effective against type B. Now, there's a bit of a problem with Bexero, is that it's um, very reactogenic. And so, you know, we've been saying for years and years, when you have vaccines, you know, don't use paracetamol. Well, with Bexero, we're saying when you use Bexero, use prophylactic paracetamol. I'm sorry, guys, only Bexero, because it, it throws off high rates of high fever. Now, fever itself is not a problem. You know, having a fever is no big deal. You've got a hot kid, they're a bit grumpy, but it's not a problem. The problem is when they're infants, they get septic workups. And so the UK found when they used Bexero that they had a high rate of people ending up with lumbar punches and septic workups because they had a fever origin unknown. So we are recommending when you use Bexero with infants and toddlers that you use paracetamol, okay, which is a bit of a hassle. Yeah. So Bexero, the infant course, is a primary course of two and a toddler booster. Okay. And then if you use Bexero in teenagers, it's a course of two. And then boosting, it's unclear at this stage, but it probably lasts around five years, but it's a pretty early vaccine and we're not quite clear yet. So for anyone on the private market, what would I advise? An infant course of two, a booster in the second year of life, and then think again, teenagers, two doses as teenagers, okay? It's bloody expensive, it's about 100 bucks a dose. So that's really expensive.